All right, when I did my PhD, my PhD advisor would say that science has given us three great gifts to humankind, and one of which was the PN junction. The PN junction, I have to agree with him, is the foundation of so many amazing things. I'm just going to show you a few in this video, right? The PN junction is the basis of critical semiconductor devices. Let's start first with a rectifying junction. What's a rectifying junction? Rectifying junction is a, is a rectifier or a dipole, a diode that only permits electrical current in one direction, right? So if you have an AC signal, right? That means it's alternating between positive 120, negative 120 out of your wall, for example, and you want to convert that to a DC signal, um, you need to cut out half of that signal, right? So it, you need to some sort of device that takes your signal like this and turns it into that. Uh, by the way, the vast majority of your devices have that. They run on DC power, but we charge them with AC power. So we need a way to convert that AC to DC, right? So these things are all over the place, rectifying junctions. How do they work? Well, let's start with a single crystal of, say, silicon. And then let's imagine that we doped it right down the middle, right? So we've got our single crystal of silicon, right? And we're going to dope it, right? So it's going to be an extrinsic semiconductor. On this side, we're going to make it P-type. Right, so this over here is going to be p-type. Meanwhile, over here on this side, we're going to dope it n-type. So why bother with this? Well, let's think about what's going to happen here. Okay, if we hook a battery up to this, let's say we hook a battery up like so. All right, the convention is like this. So that's negative. That's positive. Therefore, we're moving electrons this way. Electrons are going that way and we're moving holes this way, okay? What's gonna happen as they now enter our semiconductor material? Well, what is a, a p-type material but a material that has lots of holes built into it, right? This thing is just filled with holes in this material. And this material over here is just filled with electrons. So what will happen as we move electrons across this way? the electron is going to get in the vicinity of the hole and it's just going to recombine. It's going to fill that hole, right? It's going to fill that hole and in doing so, it's going to give off light, right? As these things recombine, you get light giving off. And the energy of that light or the wavelength, we could calculate because we know that energy is equal to HV over lambda. And we're going to assume that the same energy there is the energy of our band gap, right? So in terms of a band diagram, this is how it looks. On one side, you have your p-type material. It was filled with holes, okay? This was filled with holes, but it was right next to a material that was n-type, meaning it has lots of free electrons in its conduction band, right? Now, the Fermi level of these two materials, when they're separate, was different. The Fermi level was a little bit closer to the valence band for the p-type material. It was a little bit closer to your conduction band for your n-type material. But as soon as we bring those into contact, right, so this was before contact, after we touch them together, what we end up with is this. The Fermi level is constant all the way throughout. And the only way that the Fermi level can be constant is to have your bands bend, right? So over here, you've got it looking like a p-type material far away from the junction. And your n-type material far away from the junction, it looks like an n-type material. But in between these two things, weird stuff happens. We will not really get into in this class, but there's lots of great classes in electrical engineering and in our department. We teach some great classes on what's going on in here in this region where a p-type material meets an n-type material. But essentially think of it like this in terms of energy. Let's say now you've got these electrons up here in our current, right? Because in our when we hook this electrical current up to this thing, we're causing electrons in this diagram to travel this way into the p-type material. So what's happening? These things are moving up over here but as soon as they get over here, remember, there's a bunch of holes waiting for them, right? So what the electron is going to do, it's going to fall down and do electrical recombination. And we've already said before that that's going to involve giving off light of a very specific wavelength, which is equal to this difference in those the band gap, basically, okay? But let's now imagine the other way. If you have it go the other way, then you're moving holes continuously. If you switch the polarity of this battery, right? Then you're pulling electrons this way and holes that way. They never recombine with one another. You're just pulling these electrons that were in this valence band. You're moving them that way. And you're pulling these holes this way and you're moving them that way. So they never recombine with one another. This is how you get 
current being annihilated if you travel in one direction. So one type of charge, let's say the negative one here, that corresponds to electrons traveling to the left into the p-type where they get annihilated, right? Recombination occurs. But if they go to the right, nothing happens. You just get the current like normal. So this allows you to filter out your signal and make a rectifier, right? You're only keeping one type of your electrical signal. So that is the first type of p-n junction. By the way, what does this look like? Uh, how else could you do this? What if you ran this in reverse? If you ran this in reverse, you have a solar cell, right? Think about it. Let's start like this, right? So this time in a solar cell, what do you have? P-type and N-type materials look like this. P-type has holes, N-type has um, electrons. Now, in comes uh, some solar radiation, right? In comes some radiation, and somewhere in the middle, in the middle somewhere, in this what so-called depletion region, in this depletion region, what you have happen is that this light comes in, it hits an atom, and it provides enough energy for it to temporarily split into, you get an electron created up here, a free electron, and you get a hole created down here. Now, that electron is going to move to the right, and the hole is going to move to the left, and you just got electrical current, right? You just created electrical current. If you have negative charge going that way and positive charge going this way, you have electrical current. That is how solar panels work. How crazy is that? They put together a P-type material and an N-type material. You have this depletion region. You want to make sure that you can absorb as much of the sun's light as possible. So you're going to tune this band gap in this region. You're going to want to have it correspond to the energy coming from the sun. But essentially, that's what you're doing. Is you're creating electrons and holes, and then they're going to move out of the depletion region and create current which is pretty amazing. So that is the PN junction, uh, which is the basis of a solar cell and a rectifier. But what else can it do? It can make transistors possible. Man, transistors are so important. Here's the basics of a transistor. A transistor is like a PNP or an NPN, right? So essentially what you have is your material just like before. So you had your silicon from before. This time you're going to have a really thin region right here, which is, let's say it is... Um, we're going to make this one over here n-type, this one's going to be n-type, and this one's going to be p-type. Why do we do it that way? Because that's what I'm looking at in the diagram. In this one, you can see that the Fermi level is close to the conduction band, so it must be an uh, n-type material. Okay, But over here, it's closer to the valence band, so it must be p-type material. Now, how this works is that normally, if you tried to move electrons from the p-type, or from the n-type, through this thin p-type region, what would normally happen when you move electrons from n-type to p-type? We would get the same problem we saw before. When you move them up into this region, they're going to see the holes and they're going to recombine. And that is in fact what happens. Most of them are going to recombine in that p-type region. But if this p-type region is really thin, if it's not too thick, then some are going to get through. And what's cool is that you can bias this. You can apply an electrical field between this field in that that region and that region and so if for the ones that are able to get through the base region then they drop way down in electric potential because you've biased this and so now you amplify the signal of whatever gets through you really amplify the voltage associated with it so your guitar amp works like this right in comes a tiny little signal from the piezoelectric in your guitar right when the strings vibrate that causes a very weak signal it's not a very big voltage coming from your strings but to drive a speaker, you need a big voltage, so they pass it through a transistor, right? A transistor amplifier, you've probably heard of that, that right? A transistor, again, some of the electrons are going to get absorbed in the p-type, but the ones that don't get absorbed, that make it all the way through, that, those you bias with a large voltage, and so you get this big increase in the voltage of those. So it maintains the exact same frequency and stuff of your guitar strings, which is what you wanted. You want the same sound, you just want it louder, and so you pass it through a transistor, ampl transistor amplifier, right? So they do a gazillion things with transistors. Um, they're pretty amazing. Um, gosh, we could, again, whole classes on just on transistors exist, but in this class we're just going to say that they wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for these PN junctions that you can make in a material. And think what this means. Since this base region has to be thin, you need, as a material scientist, you need a way to have a very thin layer of, of a certain type of uh, dopants in your material, and then it can't be present. You need to have different dopants above and below it. So think of how you would do that. It starts to get pretty, tr pretty tricky. Here's one way that they can do it. This is called a MOSFET, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. It's a mouthful. 
Here's how it works. I'm not going to show the band diagram. It's too confusing for this class and it doesn't matter. We're just going to talk the basics of what's going on. In this diagram, here's what we've got. Every MOSFET has to have a source, a drain, and a gate. So your source and your drain, think of it like this. You want your electrical current to travel from your source, right, to your drain. And the only way it can do that is by traveling through the material like that. Here's the catch. Your source and your drain are n-type, right? These are n-type. But the bulk of your sample that you made this out of, this is all p-type. So you've got a built-in n-type and a p-type junction right here. That's what this sort of dark red that they've even labeled it as the depletion region. Remember the depletion region is this region between the two as you transfer from n-type or so from n-type to p-type. So they've shown this depletion region. In the depletion region, you don't have any carriers. And we know that if we try and move electrons from here into there, we're just going to get annihilation because it's pretty thick. Um, so you don't get any conduction. Therefore, if this is a transistor and you want to be able to pass electrical current sometimes but not pass it other times, right now, it just doesn't pass current. You only get an LED, basically. You've created an LED out of your thing. You're, you're going to produce light, but you're not going to produce um, any electrical current. But we can change this, and here's how they do it. They use the gate. Now it's called a metal oxide semiconductor. This region right here, shown in red, this um, that is going to be your metal, right? So you're going to connect that to metal, but it's very, very important now that this orange material, right, this one is going to be your oxide. Your oxide does not conduct electricity. So what happens is in this material, if they apply a positive charge along this gate on this metal, right, because that's going to spread the charge out over here, then you produce a negative charge on the other side of that oxide. So what did you do? You made that little region next to the oxide, you made it n-type, right? You gave it extra electrons. By accumulating that charge along the surface of that, you made it n-type, and all of a sudden, now your, your electrons, if you wanted to pass current, you could pass them through it like that. So all of a sudden, you have a tool to have electrical current travel through your device or not. It depends on the gate voltage that you apply to your gate. If you apply a gate voltage such that there is negative charge here in this region, then you get conduction. If you switch it, then you don't get conduction because now it will just be p-type like normal. So this is pretty amazing. They nowadays make these things really, really, really small. It's pretty remarkable, right? Um, so we don't have time to talk about all the different devices that you can make out of PN junctions. I'll just say that there's many. They're incredible. Um, there's whole classes on them. And they allow for all the modern electronics that we use currently, right? Um, just a few more words on that. Uh, for example, you can make things like thermoelectrics. Um, we'll have a cool demo to show you in just a minute in probably our next video where we we'll talk about thermoelectrics. But those are devices that can take a temperature gradient and turn it into an electrical current or vice versa. You can apply an electrical current and you can produce a temperature gradient. So check out my, my webpage if you want to see more about those, uh, some really cool things. It all has to do with band diagrams. It's all about P and N type materials to understand how those work. Um, you've got microelectric circuitry, right? So Richard Feynman, this famous physicist, in 1959, he gave this super famous talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom at the APS meeting, the American Physical Society. And he basically said, like, hey, we can do things a lot smaller. We can make devices like that nowadays we just take for granted, but back then they didn't had never even dreamed of it. And so he actually gave a challenge. He offered, um, what, a thousand bucks if you could make a tiny robot or something... Uh, or he offered some prize. He wanted you to be able to write um, the page of a book on the head of a pin or something like that. So there was two people that tried to do this, right? The first, uh, William McClendon, he was a watchmaker. And what he did is he used conventional tools. Like watchmaking is already like a super miniature science where you use little tiny manipulators. He did that and he was able to technically win the prize because he wrote like some letters on the pin. But he used it with existing machinery and it wasn't like this dramatic, you know, reduction in size. So he won sort of on a technicality. But then, I love this, this guy named Tom Newman, he was a graduate student, it wasn't the, the professor, it was a graduate student, he was able to reduce the text of a book by one uh, 25,000th scale and write the whole first paragraph of A Tale of Two Cities, right, the best of times, worst of times, on the head of a pin using an electron beam. So using, we talked about this, we talked about electron microscopes, how you can make them move in careful ways, right, by applying, you collimate the beam and then use magnets to move that beam around. That's what he did. And you can see it here, it says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? He was able to write the first page of that book, tiny, tiny, tiny scale. 
And that has ushered in the nanoscale revolution that we now have. We have devices that allow our phones to be, you know, incredible amount of memory and, and capability on these things because we can shrink these electronic pathways so small. We can store billions and billions of tiny transistors in, you know, per unit area, and it's getting smaller all the time. In fact, this leads to the miniaturization of circuits. Nowadays, we don't write things with, well, we can write them with electron beams. That's one way to do it. Um, but light lithography, lithography is using light to write these little tiny channels in your material. That's become a very big deal in the last 50 years. Um, and we make our transistors smaller and smaller and smaller, which allows more energy um, memory storage and things like that. But this has led to something like called Moore's Law, which is essentially said that we would be able to double the number of transistors on an integrated circuit every two years or every eight, 18 months, actually. And we've kind of seen this happen, right? If you look at the number of transistors that fit on that, it's been increasing basically at this linear relationship of Moore's Law. But we are running out of space. We're getting so small. It's predicted that we, we can't really go beyond this five nanometer transistor, right? Imagine like this gate of our MOSFET. If that distance between our gate from the two sides gets too small, we get funky quantum stuff happening, like quantum tunneling, where technically we shouldn't be able to get them passing across this energy barrier. They should get, you know, recombination, things like that. But in tunneling, it happens anyways. They leak through. And so your devices have a fundamental limit on how small they can get. Uh, and so it's going to be really interesting to see in the next uh, decade and even now what we do to solve this problem. Right here in our valley in Salt Lake City, uh, we have, you know, in Lehigh, we have uh, Micron. Micron is doing 3D cross-point memory, which is a different way of storing memory, which allows you to build vertically as well. So you not only can do it really small, but now you can build vertically. So you can stack things and get energy in much more efficient ways. And it's actually a really cool technology. So it'll be interesting to see what we come up with to deal with Moore's Law. But these are just some of the things, again, that we can talk about, all made possible by PN junctions and semiconductor control of conductivity.